Good evening, grave robbers, and welcome back to the television graveyard. We are your TV necromancers, Laura Prince and Noah Holland. We have come here tonight to examine the spirits of past television shows that ran only one season or only one episode. With me, as always, is TV's Noah Houlihan. I love being evil. Don't have to say goodbye to anyone. Shh. That looks that looks really stupid. What Let's is that? Do it. It's my signature. Uh, we are doing uh, dungeon crawlers. Yes. That, that we incorrectly said would be our first web series when we did a whole month on YouTube shows. <laughs> I mean, I think what I mean by first web series, in a way, is this is the first web series that has been um, not corporate backed. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to say homemade. Yeah. uh, That's not really accurate. I think it's the first one I can think of that's been like something that didn't have a corporation like YouTube behind it. Yeah, grassroots. Yeah. Uh, We're doing this one uh, because I have a very special perspective on this. I'm actually in this show. Yep. Uh, I play the Silicon Dragon, and this was made by my buddy, Uncle Yo. And uh, I guess we'll start with saying that uh, Uncle Yo's my boy, and he listens to this show, and we are still going to talk about it critically. Yep. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) let that be on the record. That we will talk about this uh, critically and uh, fairly, and uh, let's pour one out. Okay, so uh, Uncle Yo loves Zenkai Con and always kinds of call it, kind of calls it his home convention. And Zenkai Con is based out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, when we go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, my favorite place to go is Springhouse Brewery, where we've been with Carl. Yes. So I have a shoe fly pie porter from Springhouse Brewery. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Also, I wanted it. <laughs> that makes sense, too. And uh, like Thrak, who does whatever he wants, I wanted it. All right. I actually have the Thrak. Uh, I have an orange drink that I made with uh, food coloring. Because we didn't actually have anything that was orange. But it is a orange pineapple seltzer mixed with, since it seems like Thrak does max damage, 99 bananas. Oh god, we're gonna die. And I wanted some sort of like club garnish, but I couldn't find anything. But I did find uh, a pint glass that we have that kind of looks like a single eye. Yeah, and it says evil genius. And it says evil like genius. Like Benny. So I thought this was kind of fitting. Uh, mine's not bad. Um, mine is very chocolatey. Very chocolatey. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal a drink of Lars. ASMR time. Here we go. Mm, 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 mm. Stupendous. Fantastic and immaculate. Yeah, it's really really nice. I like it a lot. Yeah, big fan of that one. That's a good. That's good. Yeah. It's not very heavy. Yeah, that's... it's got a lot of that nice like stouty flavor without being a super super heavy beer. Yes. So now let's jump into it. This is Dungeon Crawlers. Yes. The idea of this is it's a web series. You can watch it all on YouTube. I recommend you do before you uh, listen to us. This is supposed to be the lives of the non-playable characters that you encounter during a D&D game. Yes. Or a tabletop role-playing game. Maybe it's not Dungeons & Dragons. They no. do actually specifically say, make it sound like Dungeons & Dragons. Oh, do they? Because they complain about 5th um, edition. Oh, that's right, they do. All right, so it's Dungeons and Dragons. (laughs) All right. So we open learning about our Cyclops, who is scary. Yep. Because thou shall not touch the treasure. Oh, adventurer, who dares disturb the mighty brat? You shall never have the treasure, nor see the light of day again. Yep, and his name is Thrak. His name is Thrak. He's a big orange uh, cyclops, and if you have not seen this, he is a puppet. Yes. This is, in fact, a puppet show. Yeah. Uh, It's like Sesame Street in that it's not only puppets, there are characters who appear as human. Yes. 
but unlike Sesame Street, a great deal of this is done using a blue screen. Yes. So uh, a lot of the uh, sets for this are a blue screen with superimposed the uh, the background, and then they add like a fog effect on top. It yes. Looks good. And we also um, we also meet a wraith, the other. Uh, main antagonist of the dungeon yes. for the players. He's not an antagonist of the series. He's one of our protagonists, Benny. Yes. The Wraith. Benny the Wraith. And he is in therapy. He's in therapy because he's having trouble because he's incorporeal and thus he can't physically interact with anything. And he's off his meds because he cannot take meds because he is incorporeal. Yes, and his psychiatrist is just Subscri- like prescribing him more meds to make money. He's trying to prescribe Thrak meds? Yeah, through Benny? Like, Which Benny is like, that's illegal. And it's a weird commentary on the state of Medicare in America. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're worried about um, making rent. Yes. So that very, uh, so it's become a, a slice of life. Yes. This is like a decent little premise here. It is two monsters. They live in a cave. They have to defend it from the player characters. Mm -hmm. And they also want to make it an appealing cave. Because they need to lure in player characters to kill them and take their treasure. And take their treasure. So that they can pay their rent. Yes. So it's... uh, uh, Okay, like, I can get on board with this premise. Yeah. Um, Just made myself giggle because Benny is the name of the wraith. And Benny is the character to whom Mark and Roger would have to pay their rent in rent. It's yes. not intentional. Just make me <laughs> laugh. Um, we said the word rent and Benny too many times that your brain went elsewhere. They talk about the zombies who live with them. Yes, they have like minions. Yeah. And they sent the minions to uh, like a Kinko's or... Staples. Staples. To make copies. And we get this, like, Family Guy-esque cutaway of them trying to make copies. Yes, but they're just dumb zombies and they really can't. And the cutaway is kind of just, like, arms and groans at a co- at a copy machine. Funny cutaway. Yeah. And then uh, we get the first of these, like, phone calls. Yes. And it's... Most episodes have this segment Mm -hmm. and it's Thrak. This one's Thrak on the phone with his insurance company. Right. This has some issues in my opinion. Yes. Because the premise is it is Thrak, a Cyclops character on the phone with someone. And it's, it's a good way to do a bit cheaply. I know we just talked about like Elf Princess Rain where you have characters covering their mouth. Yeah. Uh, having a character talk to someone on the phone, but you hear them, like, you only have to shoot one half of the conversation and it's easier and stuff like that. Right. What I don't understand is if the bit is that Thrak is on the phone, why is he talking into a snowball microphone? Yeah. Rather than holding a phone. (laughs) Yeah, and it, it doesn't really make sense for recording purposes either because it's not like the person speaking is speaking into that microphone. I think that's what we're supposed to understand because Thrak has uh, like headphones in that I believe are then connected to the phone and the phone's connected to the microphone. Like I believe that microphone is there to represent what he's speaking into. Okay. But like... I know it's a snowball microphone because we do this show. Like, I don't know if your average YouTube watcher knows what a snowball mic is. I mean, I'm going to be honest. They probably do now in 2020. Now that um, more people have their own channels and have their own resources. Yeah. Uh, And especially now post-COVID. Yeah, that everyone had to go out and buy microphones. But I I think you're correct in that in 2014, I don't think people would have necessarily known. Yeah, and I certainly don't know if I have... Like, I own a snowball microphone. I own a cell phone. I have no idea how I would make these two items interact with each other. 
Right. <laughs> but I saw that and I was like, maybe it's going to turn out Benny has a podcast. Yeah. But no. So I think this is an odd choice when you could just have him holding a receiver. Yeah. Of some sort. And like, it could be the joke that like, they only have a landline. Because they're a dungeon and they don't get cell reception. Yes! Like, give them, like, a rotary phone and just be like, see, it's like the olden times. Because I can, I can see where, like, a cell phone would be hard for a puppet to hold. Yes. I, I wonder if that's part of it, of it's, it's hard to get a puppet to hold stuff. Yes. And I'm actually going to, I'll circle back to this because there's another way to solve this problem, but it's connected to another problem. So just, just stay on the line, yeah, and then the the episode ends with Benny biting somebody, which is immediately negating the incorporeal premise. Because, yeah, the, the whole bit is he wishes he could bite him. And yeah. then at the end, he's able to. But I, it's not made clear to me if, like, what happened that gave him that ability. And then he's going to be incorporeal later. Yes. <laughs> so, like, I get the bit, but, like... It's breaking your own reality very early. And then, uh, that's really episode one. Yeah, it is a web show. <laughs> it, yeah, most of the episodes are very short. Uh, they, they vary in length, but this one's fairly short. It's the pilot, it's the first one, but it kind of sets up like slice of life, phone segment, ending. Yes. This one does not end, I believe, with the... Sesame Street-esque. Yes, which we'll get into in a later episode. So episode two opens up with Thrack and Benny bickering about whose turn it is to walk the gelatinous cube. Thrack? Thrack, have you seen the gelatinous cube anywhere? It's transparent, Benny! Nobody's seen it! Isn't that why we bought it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is very, like, if you go in the fantasy role-playing game Slice of Life, Mm -hmm. This is a perfectly normal argument. And, like, Thrak is wearing a stupid hat and Benny hates it. Yes. And what they're doing today is they're interviewing NPCs to help lure adventuring parties into the dungeon. Right. Uh, Because, you know, whenever you're playing one of these games, like, a villager comes up to you and goes, like, please help. Uh, My daughter's been kidnapped in this dungeon. Right. Or... Oh, that dungeon? There's treasure. Mm -hmm. Like anyone who's played a tabletop RPG kind of knows what that NPC does. So first is a wizard named Mumbar. I am Mumbar, the wizard. Okay. Uh, Tell us about yourself, Mumbar. Uh, I am Mumbar, the wizard. Who's played by Carl Custer, who also plays Benny and Thrack. Yes. And uh, Benny is not impressed. Yeah, Mumbar as a character has a presence, but he doesn't do much. Yeah, he's a lot. Uh, which is a fun, which, which is fun to I'm, do. It's not a criticism, it's yeah. his only trait. Uh, but but he, yeah, he that he's a lot. Yeah, he doesn't really have enough screen time to have traits beyond being a lot. Uh, and then we meet a female NPC who says that she's d- good at disarming traps and people. Yes. Thrak asks if she likes the hat. That's exactly what we want. Now let me ask you, young lady, what do you think about my hat? I think it's great at cutting people off, but that's just me. How do you think the hat looks, Thrak? Wait, how do you know it? I think it looks wonderful. Then that's all that matters. Thanks, Jill. You always know what to say. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, uh, are you immune to fire? What kind of question is that? No, I'm not fireproof, but I do have several jackets that are flame retardant. Stop ignoring me. And she's very charming, and this is Jill. Yes. Our third lead. Yeah. Benny doesn't like Jill, but then Jill reveals that she's killed all of the other... She's uh, tricked them into leaving. Or tricked them into leaving, rather. So, like, she's showing that she's good at her job. And Thrak likes her right away. Yeah. Uh, there's a note with the puppets here. Yes. The Jill puppet looks... Uh, maybe it's because the Jill puppet is supposed to look human. Yeah. She looks a little rougher than the Thrak and Benny puppets. Yes. But I, I think part of it is that 
Thrak and Benny are fantasy puppets. So they don't have to risk the uncanny valley because Thrak is never going to look human. Right. So your brain doesn't go like, that's not right. Yes. And I think, like, Jill is supposed to look human. There's, like, a seam on her cheek that I thought was going to be a plot-reliant scar. Okay. And I was like, oh, okay, they're going to eventually ask her how she got that scar. And it's like, no, that puppet just looks a little unfortunate. And she has the same green in her eyes as Thrak does. Yes. Which I find to be a little strange that, like, it's such a bright green. Yeah. That you would think, like... It's not, I found it draw, it drew focus. Yes. Because uh, I was like, oh, is she supernatural because it's. It's so green. Yeah. Uh, I think this is also the reason why they use a blue screen instead of a green screen. Yes. <laughs> um, and then for the uh, phone cutaway, Threat calls a pizza place. You've asked me to take a note here. Yes. So. This is when something kind of like dawns on me. Uh, Because what happens here is anytime Thrak is talking, you see Thrak being a puppet. Anytime someone from the pizza place is talking, you see the outside of a pizza place. Yes. And we we talk about TV shows like a lot. Yeah. (laughs) And a lot of the time on this show, there are, there's things that happen where, like, I can't, for the life of me, figure out why they're doing this on this show. Yeah. It's cool to do something independent like this, where it's, you know, very small crew who are trying to figure it out, who, like, do stuff, and I'm like, oh, you don't know. Yeah. Like, you're missing this. Because my, like... The audience is trained subconsciously to do this. They show the pizza place, and I immediately assume, oh, they're in a pizza place. Because it's an establishing so, shot. Because I think it's a static shot of a pizza place. It's probably an establishment shot. To, it's not. To explain an establishment shot, because I, I actually have to explain establishment shots when I teach. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best example I can think of is every episode of Full House starts with the same shot. The shot of the house. Yes. And then we go into the kitchen or the main room or whatever part of the house we're in. But the first shot in Full House is always the house. Yeah. And that's an establishment shot. This is something that is entirely missing from this series. Something as small as showing a cave. Yes. Or during like these phone call things, showing a door that just says like Thrax room. With, like, the R backwards, because he's dumb. Yeah. Something like that to be like, okay, new scene, here's a transition here. Little things like that are missing. Yeah. That would, like, really help tie this together and make it a little bit easier to follow. Because, like, these episodes, the first couple of episodes are only eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And there are still moments where I'm like, wait, what's happening? Like, because I'm not able to keep up with it because it's moving on to other topics. Yeah, it's eight minutes, but it's multiple segments. Yes. And like, if you go on YouTube and you watch an SNL sketch, an SNL sketch is five minutes. Right. So in eight minutes to have multiple scenes and segments means it's moving very quickly. Right. Uh, So Thrak orders a pizza and he's trying to get a virgin. Are any of your delivery boys virgins? Well, I have no idea, dude. I'm a Capricorn myself, so, uh, was that a yes to the garlic sauce, or, uh... Do you have any virgins? Hey, is, is this a dietary restriction thing, or an allergy? No, just a preference. Hey, buddy, I, I don't know who's a virgin and who's not. I mean, I have my suspicion. A virgin is somebody who hasn't had... Hey, 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 hey. I know what one is. Yes! This is important. Yes. I like this is a detail that turns out to be very important that I miss. And yes. like we had I had to go back and be like, did this get established? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I, I needed to say it. And then yes. at the end, Benny does the standard kid show parody thing of like This episode was brought to you by Pargon, the rune for power. Need to raise your spell up another level? Throw in a Pargon. Let's try using it in a sentence. Pargon turned the wizard's magic missile into a Blitzkrieg. 
This episode was also brought to you by the number six. Yeah, I really like this bit. Yeah. I, I think I think this segment delivers every time. Yeah, and it's what it it's simple, it it's what it needs to be. Yeah. Cause it's always like a little menacing. Yeah, I think, like, it's shot well, the joke is quick, easy to understand, easy to digest. Like, I think it's fun. Yeah. So, uh, then that we're at episode three. Right. And uh, we find out, like, Benny is still suspicious of Jill. Jill has moved in and taken the job, but Benny is still suspicious. And she's pursuing her master's degree in uh, necromancy. Right. And the other note I have here is Jill clearly records her lines in a different place than Benny and Thrack do. Yeah. And on a much lower quality microphone. And down that path, you'll find the hidden rune of worry. Rune of worry? Yes. Think of it like a proximity mind for people afraid of the idea of a trap. So if somebody worries about setting up any sort of trap. It explodes. Right. Why would you hide a trap that is only activated when people know about it? Yes, because, uh, <laughs> funny enough, I know I say I'm in this show. Uh, I never worked with the girl who plays Jill. We were never in the same place at the same time. Huh. Uh, that being said, later on after we had wrapped Dungeon Crawlers, I was doing uh, Too Many Games, and I was hosting uh, At Midnight, and one of the guests the con got me was Jill. And oh. I, like, And I didn't know until we started the show. And she was like, yeah, I'm in this show called Dungeon Crawlers. I was like, I'm in Dungeon Crawlers. She's like, I was Jill. I was like, I did a scene with you, like across time. So it was an interesting moment. Because the puppeteer for Jill was not the voice actor for Jill. Correct. Uh, which I'm establishing for our audience. You did a scene with Jill, but uh, you were in the same space as her puppeteer. Yes. Not as her voice actor. Correct. So, uh, we also find out that Benny used to be an actor. Yes. When he was alive. Mm -hmm. Which is another thing that comes up later. Yeah. Uh, Benny, like, they kind of start floating this idea of when Benny was alive, he was much different. Yeah. And he doesn't really remember his death. Yes. And we also... uh, in the cave come in these cultists of the Spider Queen, Lolf. Yes. And they're like dressed like Jehovah's Witnesses with uh, black under eye makeup meant to look like they're crying. Yes. Um, so they look like your punk friend from high school had to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> but wasn't going to take off his makeup, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they sing... Shiny black claws as dark as midnight. Suck your organs dry if you put up a fight. It's a song of fire and ice. Sus sorority pyre. You can't get any higher until she turns into a drider. It's a spider queen love and she hates your guts. Yeah. They want everybody to ha- sign up for their bake sale. Yes. I-, I would like to say, I'm pretty sure this is pre-Undertale. Right? Yeah, this was about a year before Undertale. So this is a year before Undertale, and here we are talking about a spider bake sale. Yeah. So kudos to you, Uncle Yo. Toby owes you some money. (laughs) Uh, But this is like, it's a fine bit. It's a little strange to see Uncle Yo again. Yes. Right up against... Because he was Mumbar. Because he was Mumbar. In the previous episode. Uh, But like, I can kind of be okay with the idea of like, oh, he's going to do this like every episode. He's going to be a different person. So like, I was like, oh, okay, that's what they're going to do. Like Carl's going to be in every episode as a random one shot role. Uh, This does bring up another kind of issue though that we have with this Mm -hmm. is this show really likes to establish characters that we don't see. Yeah, we never see Lolf the Spider Queen. We never see this. We see your followers, but we never see the Spider Queen. Also, the landlord to th- that they owe all this money to that owns the cave is the Red Dragon. Right. We will never see the Red Dragon. No. So it's weird having all these kind of like people that are players in this story, but never appear. Yeah, and 
it's so early that at this point we could still think like, oh, they're setting up Lolf so that she'll appear later in the season. Yeah. Uh, so they want, they're trying to pressure Benny and Threk for signing up for their bake sale. And they mention wanting money and Threk kills them on the spot. Yes. Because he... Because thou shall not touch the treasure. Yes. And they want the treasure and Threk is going to kill them. And he does. So then they kind of like argue about what to do with the bodies. And Benny's like, I guess you need to bury them. Because Benny can't do it because he's incorporeal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they use the term... I, I tried to look this term up. But I didn't see it as a... Uh, I, I couldn't find it in context of rotard? Yes, the word rotard is used many times as kind of like a a slang for idiot. Benny, it's horrible! These two rotards knocked on the door and they bullied their way past me! Or just like a go-to insult. Yeah. And... <laughs> it doesn't age real great right now in 2020. I, I, I think it was fine then. No. But like... No. It's, it's really on that line. Like, they're using this different term because it wasn't okay to say it then. I, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, I use, you know, we've been together for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was a time period where you and I were using that word. Or you and I were, like, around people who were using that word. I don't think I've ever heard Carl use that word. Yeah, I, like, nor I don't, have I. I don't know why... It's a it's not a great choice. Yeah. Because it's definitely they they overpronounce the O. Yeah. So they're definitely intending it to be a different word. Mm-hmm. It's I feel like they should have gone the Avengers route. Cause uh in Avengers, Loki calls Black Widow a quim. Which is how he can use a version of the C word in a PG thirteen right. movie. Right. I think if maybe they'd gone and looked up like a really, really old insult. I I almost think it's it's fun to have a word that's your own slur, mm -hmm. like you know, like mud blood. Or uh, every once in a while, I'll throw out wamps. This wamps, which is from recess. Oh my god! Somebody wrote somebody graffitied mud blood in the elevator of uh, my freshman dorm, <laughs> which is how you know you went to school with nerds. Yes. Uh, so I think the idea of having your own, like, in-universe slur, that kind of, you know, branding mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Because if you have, if you make up your own word, then you can make, like, a t-shirt. I don't think I'd wear a Rotard's t-shirt. Yeah, you, you <laughs> can't really. It's too close. Yeah. Like, I would have gone either really, like, make up your own entirely or go yeah. really, really old. Yeah. Because, like... Anyone who uses the word quim thinks about Loki. Yeah. Because no one has any other context for that word. Uh, but they use it a number of times. Yeah. It's not... Yeah, every time it's kind of like... <laughs> yeah, I cringe every time they do it. Because, like, the discourse around it being a slur was already, like... Because mm -hmm. I know in, like, the 2000s... People weren't really aware that it was, like, a slur. Yeah. Because word, word usage changes. Mm hmm So, anyway. Uh, then we get to the phone segment. Yes. One thing I want to point out here really quickly... Yeah? ...is through these first three episodes, they are working at this weird handicap. Mm hmm Because they are trying to establish scale. Yes. So, Benny... And Thrak, throughout these three episodes, are never seen in the same shot at the same time. Right. This way, Benny can always be looking up, and Jill can always be looking up, and Thrak can be looking down to establish that Thrak is a giant uh, cyclops. Which is cool, but like you're working at such a disadvantage when you're constantly having to worry about that. Yeah. And I have the thought at this point, like, you know what they need? They need, like, Thrax legs or torso or something for a shot. It's a shame they don't have that. Stay tuned. 
Uh, so Thrak calls a Chinese restaurant. Uh, he asks for lo mein, a live cow, and a virgin in bean sauce. Mm-hmm. And the man on the phone is indignant. A virgin in black bean sauce. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up a minute. Did you say virgin? Do you have them or don't you? That is disgusting. You, sir, are a monster. Our versions only come sweet and sour. But I have a coupon from Foursquare. Those expired last month. <laughs> right. Which is like the bait and it's switch. A, yeah, it's a good bait and switch joke. And they won't honor the coupon. And then the guy on the phone may or may not shoot his coworker to yeah. bring the Thrak. Which is like... <sighs> I always say I don't like that, like, adult swimmy violence as a punchline, and mm-hmm. that's what this kind of feels like to me. Yeah, I, I think this joke can be done. Like, actually, I remember somebody gave me, like, jokes every guy should know. Mm-hmm. And, like, the number one best joke in the world, according to this book, is uh, a guy is out hunting with his friend, uh, and he accidentally gets shot. So he calls 911 and he's like, uh, 911, help, please. Uh, my friend's been shot. I think he's dead. And the 911 operator's like, oh, okay. Everything's going to be fine. First thing you do, make sure that he's dead. Bang! Okay, now what? Like, it's a decent joke. Like, the, 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 all the elements are there. I would put this joke closer to that one. In that it's not violence for violence sake. It plays into what they were talking about. And it's a surprise. It's not like your your uh, Metalocalypse. Where it's just like, well, they're at a concert. So someone's going to get beheaded. <laughs> right. So that's episode three. Yes. Um, episode four includes a new opening that includes Jill. Yes. Welcome Jill to the music. Um, and they... I'm not really sure what happens in this episode. Is this the one... This is where they start playing Dungeons and Dragons? No. That's the next episode. Really? Yeah, this is the, like... Something with smells? Like, I'm very confused in this episode. The notes I have include uh, a couple lines of dialogue where it's, Firefly sucks. Go to hell, you nearsighted whore. (laughs) Um, Thrak might eat Jill. Yeah, they, this is important. They establish that uh, Jill needs to wear perfume. Yeah. Because since she smells human, that Thrak might eat her. Yes. <laughs> Which is a fun little, like, you know, twist to add to things. And we establish that there's, again, another unseen character. There's an owlbear in the basement. Yeah. Which feels like Chekhov's owlbear. Yeah. Um, which it, is... I just wanted to say Chekhov's Alabama. Yeah, it's more of a reference than establishing a character. But again, this early in the series, we're not sure what's what. And then we establish that Jill killed Benny when she was alive. Yes, it's like she slips up and says that. How come you're suddenly helping Jill? I mean, last week you didn't even trust her. And who can blame you after she helped kill you the first time? <laughs> what? Thrak! There's my barefoot Contessa! Yes. And Benny is like, wait, what? And then we, we move on past it. So now there's intrigue. Yeah. And uh, the phone segment is really just like Thrak dropping a whole bunch of like millennial insecurity. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it definitely hits home if you're a certain age. Right. But it, this was a strange episode. This was an episode that didn't feel like a lot happened yeah outside of the reveals yeah but we it is important that we establish those key elements so episode five they're playing a tabletop rpg it is not dungeons and dragons right it's uh jill's objective is to find out why the school swim team is disappearing it's very much like an anime inspired yeah tabletop rpg and they actually refer to it as japanese schoolgirls. yes and there's a tentacle monster in the uh pool yeah, at first I thought they were doing, like, the, the the obvious joke of, like, them playing a tabletop game that was, like, going to be a normal school day. Mm-hmm. But no, <laughs> that's not what they're doing. And Thrak keeps trying to say the Jill craps her pants. Yes, they're, they're trying to, because Benny is the, the 
DM for this. Yes. And uh, Thrax just trying to make that happen. Like she's trying to railroad the group into making sure that happened. But I need to point out, because this is important, it's all three of them seated around a table. Yes. So now they're all in one shot. Yes. So all the time in the earlier episodes, trying to establish Thrax's size is gone. I mean, I kind of didn't notice it because I, I thought that I was like, oh, maybe Thrax just has super long legs. Um, I, I didn't really notice this issue because I was like, oh, they're at tables. Uh, I'm short. And if I'm at a table, I'm the same size as other people who are taller than me. I guess in my mind, I was just like imagining if he's that big, like his head is bigger than everyone. Mm-hmm. Like, because they're looking straight up at him. Like, to then put them all next to each other like this, I found a little confusing. Okay. It didn't bother me in the least. Okay. Um. So Jill rolls low, so Thrak keeps trying... Anytime Jill has to roll, if she rolls low, Thrak yells that she crapped her pants. Yes. Uh, so, and then we establish there's another roommate, an invisible roommate named Maurice. Yes. Who has not been mentioned up to now. Yes. And uh, Maurice is playing a female character who identifies as male and is, quote, going through some stuff. Which I, I this is the kind of humor that, like, in five short years, has changed significantly. Yeah. Like, we know so much more about, you know, transgender awareness, and mm-hmm. we, we're we kind of watching in real time jokes that people made in the mid-2010s already don't work. Yeah. It's kind of like when you watch an 80s movie in high school in the 2000s, and you're like, whoa, yeah. all like- of these movies are predicated on rape. Like, when I saw this, like, it didn't even, like, dawn on... Like, I wouldn't say I was offended, but, like, it didn't dawn on me as a joke. It was kind of just like, oh, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah, they're going going through stuff. That's hard. (laughs) Like, I was just like, okay, this is... Like, I was intrigued, and I was like, yeah, that's fine. I support this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like, like it was trying to play as a joke. Yeah, like, I, it didn't even dawn on me. I was like, oh, that was that said for laughs? <laughs> um, the problem I mainly have with this is it is an invisible character. Yes. Which, again, felt like we are trying to uh, not... To, we're, we're trying to get around having another puppet. Yeah. So we have an invisible character, so it's easier. When you have an invisible character, stuff's got to float. Yeah. Like, you need to see the invisible person interact with someone. Or else your mind's like, well, is this a uh, a disembodied voice? Like, does this person have form of any kind? Uh, the, like, when I first saw it, like, my first thought was whatever was being shown was talking. Yeah. And I was like, oh, weird. And I was like, no, no, wait, it's an invisible person. Like... The invisible character sounds like it's so easy mm-hmm. to, to do, but it's the hardest thing to do. Absolutely. So, and it's Patrick Warburton's, like, impression voice. Yeah, and like... <laughs> Which I, I, I don't know why, but... We establish that Maurice has joint custody of his daughter, Lynn. Right. To kind of just, like, establish a little bit more about Maurice, because it's episode five and we just met him. Uh, and then we go right to the phone bit. Episode five is short. Yes. Um... The first five or six episodes, I feel like they haven't um, kind of gotten to the meat of the story. They're just still setting up. Right. With a 13-episode web series, we spend a lot of time in the setup. Yeah. And things kind of fly at you. And, and this show could benefit from... It's not, it's not a great practice storytelling-wise, but the as-you-know exposition... Yeah, something like As You Know would be good. Or, like, at this point, it's hard to... It's hard when you have this many episodes with no payoffs. And that's not, like, an insult. Like, I don't feel like you you paid anything off yet. There's nothing that makes you learn as an audience, like, hey, the stuff that we're saying here is going to be important. Yes. Like... 
at this point, it's really even unclear if there's continuity. Yeah, like, this could be a status quo is God show. Yeah. So, like, granted, like, we move from one episode to another where Jill becomes a character. But, like, beyond that, it could just be, like, you can watch these in any order, and it's, like, sitcom But what it's really doing is telling a larger story. But it's not clear that we should be using that part of our brain. Yes. Um, and then the phone bit, I, I have the note, is this Doug? Because this voice sounds like Doug Walker. Yeah, was it Doug? Uh, I believe it was, yes. Okay. Uh, so episode six. Episode six. Uh, this is... Uh, we're going to talk about this one a lot. Okay. This is the one where they're actually a party of adventurers comes into the... Yeah. And the whole party is made of halflings. So everyone thinks this is going to be an easy... Like, oh, we don't even have to do anything. The trolls will get them. And the party one-shots the trolls with a free action. And that's when... Uh, Benny screamed. Benny! They're fourth edition! Fourth edition? You mean the edition that makes every character into an unstoppable Mary Sue? I thought the conversion wasn't until next month! Right. So there, there's when you get like, okay, we are establishing we are in Dungeons and Dragons. I know like, we use Owlbear, which is like, mm. a Dungeons and Dragons thing. Uh, this is a really tough sequence. Yes. Because this is when both the lack of budget and the lack of experience really uh, become apparent. Yeah. So, in this one, once again, we have, basically, there's two shots we cut back and forth. There's Jill alone, and then Benny and Thrak. So once again, I'm upset, because <laughs> scale is thrown off. Yeah, because Benny and Thrak are now just in the same shot yes. regularly, and now it's a problem. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Yo is puppeteering uh, Benny Enthrak and is clearly visible. Yes. And it's a bummer. <laughs> I, I think more than him being clearly visible, he's also looking down at a script. Yeah. And staring down the camera lens. Yeah. And like, you're using a green screen so you can fix this a little. Yeah. Like, you can, you can, you know, try to cut out the background and put it over him. You could CGI a bush. Yeah. Like, it, and it can look a little cartoony and just kind of try to hide him here. And, like, he is so visible that it feels purposeful. Yeah. And... Not only is he visible, he's often looking down the lens. Yes. And, like, I don't want to beat the shit out of this show, but it's hard to ignore something that's making eye contact with you yes. as a human. <laughs> and, and what I thought about here a lot is uh, one of my all-time ride-or-die favorite musicals is Avenue Q. Right. Avenue Q, for those of you who are not ride or die in the musical theater, uh, is a Sesame Street parody. And with the puppets, and you just see the puppeteers, and that's kind of part of it. Yeah. Like, the puppets are expressing, and so are the puppeteers. Mm -hmm. The puppeteers are usually in very plain clothing, and... But they know you can see them, and they react facially. Mm -hmm. um, John Tartaglia stands out. Uh, he was the original Princeton and Rod. And there's a lot of times I remember, you know, Princeton's puppet has his mouth gaping open. And John Tartaglia kind of has that added emotion. Right. So not only like, oh, okay, Princeton's jaw dropped because he's scandalized, not because he's scared. Mm -hmm. Like, it kind of added more context. Because, yes, like... I love the Muppets. We've established how much I love the Muppets. Right. But if you're not Jim Henson or Frank Oz, there are limits to what you can do with a puppet's expressions. Right. Unless you're Jim... If you're Jim Henson, you can do anything with a puppet. Mm -hmm. Jesus God. Um, but I, I felt like they could have made the choice of like, you see the puppeteers, what? Yeah, they could have. But like, I think if you make that choice, it's very hard for Uncle Yo, who is 
two different puppet characters who are often interacting with each other and in it as a human. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, you, like, there's no way I feel like this was intentional. Yeah. Like, the, that they just changed the way this is done. I think this is a mistake. Since the lines are clearly recorded ahead of time, I would think that you could just be like, okay... I mean, Thrak and Benny appear in the same shot multiple times, so... Uh, Carl isn't controlling both of them at the same time. I think he is here. He might be. He's not doing it in every shot. <laughs> right, right. So what, I, what I'm arguing is you cast somebody. Carl might be doing the voice for both. But And just have that person react facially and have all of them kind of be facial actors, but not saying lines, not mouthing lines mm-hmm. or anything. Just kind of leaning into like... Yeah, you can see the puppets. We don't have a budget. Leave us alone. Yeah, I I think that f- often they do a good job of hiding the puppeteer, and I think it's better that way for this show. It's a way to go to have the puppeteer scene, but alternately, you know what could have solved this whole problem? A blue blanket. Yeah, you just put a blanket over the puppeteers. Yeah, I I think that's been done. In, oh yeah, like. That's how they do, like, Rocket. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Richard, who I, who's another friend of mine, shout-outs to Cameron Ninja from the Lisa playthroughs, uh, had the technology to green screen that well, because as someone who's worked with green screen slash blue screen, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, so, like, just because you have that blanket on doesn't mean it'll work perfectly. Uh, but I get what you're saying. It'll work better. It would work better than Because I'm yeah. going to be honest, this is the worst-case yeah. scenario of... Having the puppeteer looking at you Mm -hmm. makes it incredibly difficult to stay immersed in the scene. On top of that, the entire scene is the characters describing something we're not seeing. Yeah. Because they're fighting this adventurer, these adventurer party, but we're not seeing them get defeated because they're unable to show that because it would require like... A fight scene. Yeah, and more actors and more puppets and more... But long story short, uh, Jill throws Mr. Pointy... Mr. Cuddy. Mr. Cuddy. Which is an axe. Yes. And uh, able is able to save the day, basically, with yes. this. As but... they described. But we had to watch this twice, because the first time we watched it, I looked at you and went, What happened? I was looking at your car. <laughs> Yeah, and then, but Benny gets hit with a blessed item, which is extremely important. Go, Mr. Cuddy! The drone exploded when the tomahawk hit it! It's raining acid down all over the halflings! They're melting! I think we're saved, Benny! And thanks to our lack of Kickstarter budget, we didn't have to show any of that on camera. That's the magic of low budget entertainment, kids. What we lack in Kickstarter funds, you make up with your imagination. Come on, Frack! Let's go loot their corpses. I think it's a minor artifact. This thing radiates healing energy. Like when I ate that Greek yoga instructor. Here, check it out. If it heals the living, Thrak, keep it away from me. Ready? And then there's, they need to get an underappreciated comedian. (laughs) Yes. They are like, do we still have that underappreciated comedian tied up in the basement? Yeah, now he'll never get into Paxis or Magfest. Yes, which... He did get into Magfest. I was on that show with him. <laughs> but they end up riding him like a horse. Yes, Jill does. Like yes. Jill just rides him like a steed. Yes. And keeps calling him white boy. Yeah, which is a weird choice. <laughs> um, and then, like, the Thrak phone thing is him calling a necromancer to try to get help for Benny. Mm-hmm. And there's a great line of like, hi, necromancy. We're raising the bar and raising the dead. Yep, great line. And uh, he's calling because his roommate is a dying wraith, but he's not very helpful while he's on the phone. Well, he's not calling because Benny's dying. He's calling about something else while Benny dies. I mean, he's calling a necromancer. He is calling. He's just, he's not paying attention very well. Okay. Like Maybe he's I'm calling getting... a necromancer. Okay. But he's just like not... Because this is where, like, to me, the big switch happens, mm-hmm. where, like, s- something that I thought was established kind of goes away. 
witches, like, Thrak is dumb, but the strength. J- uh, Jill is kind of like the skill, but Benny hates her. Yeah. And Benny is evil, but like is trying to herd the cats. Yeah. Like he's kind of in charge of the plans and is trying to manage these elements that are out of his control. He's the Jim Helper, like super straight man. Uh, I wouldn't say Jim Helper because Jim doesn't care about the job. I kind of like, I want to say Pinky and the Brain. Yeah. I want to say it's like this, uh, Benny's a dick, but he's the one with the drive. Yeah. So like he'll put up with Jill even though he hates her because she's skilled. He'll put up with Thrak even though he hates him because he's strong. In this moment, we've also had this kind of like turn of like Benny's death being sad and unfortunate and unknown. And now Benny's suffering. Yeah. And Thrak becomes a dick immediately. And I was just like, wait, what are these characters now? Like, it, the status quo kind of goes away. And I, 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 it might just be like, I misunderstood these characters. Yeah. But I feel like all the ideas I had about these characters get betrayed and I have no idea what's going on anymore. Yeah. Uh, And so the next episode is kind of Benny in a dark mana circle, like kind of a fever dream. Yes. And he goes into a light and he hears a familiar ukulele. Yes. And it's Scaldi. Scaldi. Played by Brental Floss. Our buddy Brental Floss is in this. And I, I don't know how quickly this is established, but I think it's pretty quickly that Scaldi is Benny when he was alive. Yes. And what ends up happening, we'll go through this kind of quick, is first he runs into Jill. Who tries to entice him into the cave. Who entices him into the cave. He goes into the cave. He meets Thrak. And Thrak is big and scary, but they become friends. And there's like a montage. Yeah, of them just kind of like jamming out and being fun and stuff like that. I like all of this. All of this is very fun. It feels very Muppets Tonight, Muppet Showy. Yeah. Of like puppet interacting with human, but it not being weird. Yeah, and it not being like, sure is a puppet. Yeah, because like, like... Too th- scaldy, Thrak is a cyclops and he's real. Because I also feel like, and I'm, I may be wrong, but I don't think Morbo the wizard or the spider people are ever interacting directly with the puppets. I think they're in other shots. This we get a nice one shot of puppet with Brent. Yes. And like, now it feels like connected and alive and it's fun. Then Thrak, like, is singing along and accidentally hits Scaldi in the face and kills him. Yes. Thus making him Benny. But confusingly... <laughs> but we'd established a few episodes ago that Jill had killed That Benny. Jill killed him. And I guess you could argue it's Jill's fault because Jill told Scaldi to go into the cave. But based on what we saw, how does Jill even know this man died? No idea. <laughs> Let alone is Benny. Also, like, Jill didn't work for the cave when Benny was alive. Yeah, like, there's a lot of just, like, confusion. And the... the I'm, I'm going to get into this a lot later. But, like, this is funny. But it makes me, like, question, like, what am I paying... What am I here for? Am I here for a story or am I here for jokes? Yeah. Um, and Brent's dead. <laughs> Well, they, there's a discussion between Benny and Scaldi. Yes. As they kind of like cross game. paths. Man, I went down faster than a troop of Girl Scouts under a flamethrower. I mean, no, he went down. Uh, no. Wait. Wait. That was me. That was me. I I was M. Was. Was. Scaldi. I'm afraid so, Benny. You Rotar! With an armor class that low, you deserve what happened. You couldn't afford a decent helmet? Not after splurging on this sweet bard outfit. But it does serve me right. I maxed out my charisma and totally ignored my wisdom score. We're both dead. Why are you okay with this? 
Well, because even though my part of the journey is over, my original quest still continues. Take care of the big guy for me, will you? And so they kind of like cross paths as Benny comes back to life. Mm-hmm. And on, on life. And yeah, it comes back to Unlife and Scaldi, I guess, crosses over. So then we get the Thrak cutaway. Right. Uh, we get the Thrak phone sequence. He calls the guy who makes the phone book because he's mad that the phone book changed. Yes. Yeah, so the phone book guy is just explaining why the phone book changes. Mm. And the Thrak goes, I'm offended. And that makes me entitled. Yeah. And that is mid-2010s uh, hot takes yeah. about cancel culture. Yeah. Uh, about, like, people being offended by things in nerd culture. Yeah. And the entitlement that goes with that. I think it works coming from Thrak. Who's yeah. a very simple character. Yeah. Like, I kind of like the idea of, uh, like, the entitled millennial that is just so on the nose because he's stupid. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I guess if you think about, like, Thrak being an entitled millennial, mm-hmm. I guess that kind of works. Yeah. It's weird to place Thrak as an entitled millennial when Uncle Yo's in the same age demographic. Like, it's yeah. not like a kids these days take. Yeah. Like, it's a very weird, like, me these days. Well, yeah, I mean, like, just because we're in the same age de- demographic doesn't mean, like, I identify with every person in that demographic. Like, I think, I honestly think this commentary... Then put down your- avocado toast so we can buy a house i don't like avocado toast you know this <laughs> i i actually think this whole idea is funnier now yeah because we can kind of look back on it like semi retrospectively rather than being when we were in that world yeah <laughs> so i don't know i gotta chuckle whoa boy i sure do like to talk hi editor noah here and uh my voice is a little bit scratchy right now because we recorded for two hours and I'm realizing now that's really long for one episode. So we're going to go ahead and break it up here and you can tune in next week for the rest of our thoughts on Dungeon Crawlers in part two. So thank you so much for listening. A few plugs before you go. Be sure to check out our Patreon. It's not fully set up right now if you want to just kind of poke around. But we'll start updating that in the new year with lots of fun new prizes and what's the word I want here? Perks. Fun perks. Also, be sure to check out Battle Royale, royale royale.com. You can sign up for our video game competition happening on January 16th. You can win up to $500. So be sure to check that out at Battle Royale, royale royale.com. Also, be sure to follow me at Plus Two Comedy, and follow Laura at Stay Doomed. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, stay doomed.